second day of the conference. And uh, we'll begin with the second lecture of uh, Professor Yan Yan Li. Thanks. So, uh, so if if a function satisfy this uh, equation, degenerate elliptic equation, so in a punctured plane, punctured space, then you should be radially symmetric. So actually, u can be continuous, uh, satisfying the e equation in viscosity sense, uh, but let's prove it for C2. So let's uh, recall uh, this definition. So, so this uh, gamma is, is something like in Rn. Uh, it's a cone, a symmetric cone, and uh, on one side of the half, the half plane, half space on this half. So this is gamma one on this side. So, so if lambda of AU, AU is the uh, conformally invariant operator. So, so it's on this surface, then it should be radially symmetric. So if this gamma is this gamma one, if this gamma is this gamma one, so namely the eigenvalue on this boundary of this hyperplane, then the equation is actually uh, Laplace and u equal to zero, so harmonic function. So this is a kind of nonlinear version of that. <coughs> So last time we described a, a procedure to prove this result, and uh, we only need to prove the following uh, proposition. So it's a comparison principle. So if this, well, one can, yeah, this is a this is a subsolution of the equation. So we can take it on the boundary of gamma will also be a subsolution. So that's a solution. So this is subsolution, this is a super solution. So it's on the other side of the of the cone. So subsolution and super solution with finite singular points. And if we have a V, the singular one is greater or equal than the regular one on the boundary, then we'll have an order, so the singular one should be greater or equal than u. So this is a, a comparison principle. So we'll we'll prove this uh, result, and let's prove it for an easier case, the proof will be similar uh, for more singularities. So let's say 
we only have one singularity. Let's say we have a bounded open set and U is C2. And it's a sub-solution. And there's a V, which is C2, but having a singularity, possibly having a singularity. And V greater or equal than U on the boundary imply V greater or equal than U in the domain. So we'll prove this. So we just take one singularity. And last time, we have proved this comparison principle if there's no singularity. Yeah. So there's a fact that if something is in gamma, that would imply this is superharmonic. So this is just because of the, uh, the structure. When, when we take trace, we will see a positive multiple of minus Laplacian u. So if on this side, it's always a superharmonic function. And uh, to prove this, we will use two elementary facts for harmonic functions. So we are going to, because we, what we are, our super solution is always superharmonic. So we can use, so one is if we have a superharmonic function, away from a point, non-negative, then either W is identically zero, or at this singular point, it should be positive. It's, it's just saying that you don't, we don't see this singularity. So this is a classical result because, uh, because a point uh, is of capacity zero. So, so capacity zero sets are the sets which have this property. Yeah. You don't see the singularity. So the second lemma says that if we have a superharmonic function, I forgot to write superharmonic. So I should add Laplacian V less or equal to zero. So it's a superharmonic function So it's a superharmonic function. Uh, well, of course, in, in one dimension, this is not true. I can write a superharmonic function. But I can certainly take a W1 like this. I can do a W2 like that. And the gradient is not the same. But that's, that's because it's in 1D. So uh, here, because this harmonic capacity is zero, so it's actually a superharmonic function across. So one cannot have, if, if we have W1, W2 like that, one have to have a, the same gradient. So these are two uh, simple facts. And I forgot to write uh, superharmonicity in the second lemma. Yeah. So let's, uh, now we can prove this result uh, by read, yeah. So we, we prove this, we prove this result.
comparison principle. So suppose now, so then this V will be less than U somewhere. So, uh, if we draw the arrow here, uh, one may have a, a U like this, and the V uh, might be something like that. This is V. So somewhere it, it's below U. And uh, by lemma 2.1, this inf u v should be positive. So, so v will be bounded from below. So therefore, uh, we can replace, we just multiply v by a bigger than one constant. So we may assume so be because multiplying uh, this v by a constant, it doesn't change the equation. The equation stays the same. So so we have a U like this, and V will be this is boundary and maybe touch somewhere like that. So the arrow could be here or maybe touch at the arrow. Well, actually, from here, we know that this lim inf. has to be touching the arrow. One cannot have a picture like this because if one has such a picture, then, so, so this picture will not occur, one has to touch at the arrow. So because otherwise, so this has to be true if we have a inequality like that in here, then for small ball, this V will be bigger than U. So we are going to take a little ball, so it's going to be bigger than U. Then one can just apply comparison principle on omega minus this little ball. So now u and v have no singularity, so reduced to the case we already proved, that will tell v bigger than u outside. So these two will violate that. So we know that uh, whenever it's like this, you touch uh, boundary is bigger, V is bigger than U, then it has to be touching actually at a singular point. It might touch elsewhere, but at least it should touch the singular point. So then, uh, so then, what we can do for this picture? The, so now we know that this v has to be touching at zero, somehow touching here. This is the so, and u is 
on the boundary, there is a little distance, yeah, positive. positive. So, therefore, for epsilon small, for small epsilon fixed, we look at all x less than epsilon. And then we look at the function by translation a little bit. This function, we translate a little bit. So when we translate a little bit, so on the boundary, because there's a gap, so, so they are far away always. And here, uh, you, it may cut through this, uh, it may cut through this picture or it may be detached. But then I can always find a positive constant multiplied by that so that I adjust it. This function will satisfy the inf is equal to zero. So Yeah, if maybe it's higher, maybe it's lower, I adjust it a little bit. So, so this wx is still uh, a solution. So our equation is translation invariant, multiplying constant is also invariant. And we also know that v is bigger than wx on the boundary. So it's exactly like what we argued before. So therefore, we know that we must have wx0 for every x, it should be equal to the limb inf. And let's call this number alpha, just, just like here. So this is true for every x, and therefore, by lemma 2.2, So all these functions is touching this V from below at a singular point. So uh, at a point, so the, the, the gradient should be the same. So we know that gradient Wx at zero should be equal to the same V. This V is independent of uh, this X. Well, and now this is clearly equal to lambda of x, w of u of x, by definition. This is equal to that, because it's just a translation. If we put zero, this is the value. And here, we take the derivative, so this is, will be equal to lambda of x, gradient u of x. And we replace this lambda through here. We are going to see this is alpha divided by u. So it's a gradient log u of x. Uh, yeah. So that means for every x we have this. That means log u of x is going to be equal to this vector dot x plus a constant. So for all x in, in, in B epsilon. So then this is exponential. So if we calculate Laplacian u here, it's going to be equal to e to the b. So it's greater or equal than zero. So, so therefore, this u is actually superharmonic, but v is subharmonic. So, so we so we know that v minus u will be less or equal than zero, and v minus u greater or equal than zero, also in this ball. But we know that they touch at a point. So this means they have to be the same. 
So that means V has to be equal to U. So that so you, so V is smooth actually. So it's it goes back to the uh, situation we already proved. So in the smooth case, we know that comparison principle holds. <clears throat> so so therefore, we have proved this uh, symmetry result. So consequence of that is the Liouville theorem. So any solution in the entire space will be a constant. So I will, uh, next I will prove another uh, analysis result. So this is kind of symmetry result, Liouville theorem. Another uh, result here in in this, in, the, in such studies, is a gradient estimate. So, in, in this generality, actually, it's proved quite early. So. If we have a solution, this is a constant. So it's upper bounded then it will imply gradient log u will be less than a constant depending on b. So if a solution is upper bounded by a constant, and uh, then it gradient log is bounded. So that implies the Harnack. So actually for this estimate, the main subtle part is on this side, it's not assuming it's bigger than a positive constant. So the proof we'll present here will make use of the Liouville theorem we just proved. So we recall uh, what all this, uh, this gamma is the cone, the operator is here. So it's a conformally invariant operator. So We'll prove this by first proving the part which is uh, which is easier to handle. So is to assume actually we have a lower bound also. So then the conclusion is to prove. The gradient is less than a constant, which depends on A also. So I'll prove this. So then the second step is try to uh, prove uh, without this A dependence. And for that, we'll need to use the Liouville theorem uh, we just proved. Is a C of B in the of, final S? Ah, okay. Yes. It, okay. it also depends on F and gamma. Okay, okay. So I, I mainly. But you stress the dependency on the L infinity. Only, okay. Yeah, B. Thanks. Yeah. 
the upper bound. So here we impose a lower bound now. So for this, so the method is, uh, this method is more standard. It's a Bernstein type argument. Uh, I have, so I will, I will not show all the computations, but just show the schemes. So the scheme can be applied and has been applied to uh, rather broad uh, class of equations. So, so we write uh, log u as v. So then, if we look at V, then it's an equation, it's a fully nonlinear elliptic equation. So it's not uh, uniformly elliptic, it's elliptic, yeah, but not uniformly elliptic. So, and uh, it's a, in this particular case, this Nonlinearity with respect to the Hessian of V is through the eigenvalues of this. Yeah. In general, the method uh, can be applied, uh, it doesn't have to apply to equations of this particular dependence through eigenvalues. So it's a nonlinear elliptic equation. So you have Hessian of V involve first derivative and involve V. So you have a nonlinear elliptic equation. So we want to prove gradient has a bound because the bound on U will translate to a bound on V. So the V will be lower bounded. I didn't write the V bound. So uh, V is here. So V will be having both sides of bounds. So for this type, Bernstein type argument, so it's easier uh, uh, to, to keep track of things if we have both bounds. If we only have one side bound, uh, it becomes uh, rather tricky. So one has to uh, keep track of things very, very carefully and, and more. So, so that's why we impose one side bound. So we have a full C0 estimate. So C0 on V is bounded. Then we want to estimate gradient. So, so this, for the success of using this method, it depends on the structure of the equation. So, some, yeah. And uh, so we, we want to get local estimates, and, and our equation is very good, and actually it has local estimates. So it's <clears throat> for some other equations, uh, you would not have local estimates like Monchamper equation in high, in three dimension up. So, and uh, now let's take a cutoff function. Because we want to get uh, local estimates, we take a cutoff function. Inside B1, it's one, outside B2 is zero, and it's nicely in between. So we look at a function, rho is cut off, and we take gradient V square, and we multiply by something depending on V. So this phi, we leave it uh, flexible, and we look at the computation to choose later on what kind of v phi uh, it can work. Well, we, it turns out this is the phi we are going to use. So we are going to use a phi satisfying first inequality and the second inequality on a closed interval. So then it's very easy to pick up such a fee. So on the other hand, if we insist to have a half ray, and such fee would not exist. Otherwise, I mean, this method will just give the whole thing. So we want to prove that this G has an upper bound. When the G has the upper bound. So this C should be a constant. 
depending on our alpha and beta, and of course, depend on the phi you choose, so, but doesn't depend on V. So we want to prove this. So, well, then this, because G is zero outside B2, so there, there is an interior maximum point. So the maximum point you fix at pick up maximum point, you try to prove the value at the maximum point is universally bounded. So, well, if G is have an interior maximum point, the gradient should be zero. So this means partial derivative in Xi. So it should all be zero. So this will give us an expression involving phi, phi always through V of X zero, involving phi, phi prime, gradient V, and Hessian V. So because our expression involves up to gradient V. So take one derivative, we will get an expression here. So we have n equations. So we freeze at x zero. So then we take the Hessian. The Hessian should be less or equal than zero because it's, it's a maximum point. And we evaluate at x zero. So we are going to see an expression involving this. So now up to third order derivative. So the equation is a second order equation. We hit a derivative, we are going to see this. It should be right hand side is zero. We are going to have an equation involving theta up to third derivative of v at x zero. So then we don't, we forget uh, the equation. We just use this, this information. Yeah. So now, because of ellipticity, f lambda i is positive, we hit this one. It's a negative definite matrix, so we make a summation. We should have less or equal than zero. So now, at x zero, we have one, information is one, and two, and three. So in this, in this two and three, one can easily replace the third derivative of v by derivative up to second order. And we also use this equation to replace, to insert to this inequality. So we are going to have an inequality evaluated at x zero, and that's an expression, uh, it's rather long, uh, uh, involving data up to this, up to second derivative, like this. But, but once you write it down, it's quite clear uh, uh, which one is what you want, and so on. Anyway, so then I hide a half page computation. So then you use, then you will end up with something like this. So this is what you will end up. So you are going to see a expression like this inequality. So now this certainly give a bound on rho times that, namely give a bound on g. So this gives the upper bound for a gradient estimate. I seem to have run way faster than I thought. <laughs> that seems to be an uh, uh, interesting uh, thing. Now it reminded me something happened many, many years ago when I was in Taiwan. I don't know, Louis was there maybe, I don't know. It's for birthday of Louis Nuremberg. 
So I gave my talk, and uh, I finished halfway. And I looked at the audience, and I said, what should I do? I remember Varada was sitting there. He said, well, you could start all over again. <laughs> We should thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, you, 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 you continue. Uh, I could uh, add something on the spot. Very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> they will thank you again. Uh, okay, soon. <laughs> so, like, but but, uh, but it's really a surprise. Uh, I thought it's so long, so I, I put everything on the on the slides and hide all the computations, and. Uh, So, so maybe I'll, I'll describe briefly what I will describe next time. Next time I will have uh, formula. So, so, so now uh, we have proved that. So now the next step to prove these estimates is to prove a holder estimate. So step two. So step two, we, are, we, we want to uh, prove that, so now our solution, our solution, our solution is bigger than zero and less than B, let's say in B3. <coughs> so we would like to prove Instead of a gradient estimate, we are going to prove uh, first a holder estimate. So we will, we will prove a holder estimate. So. So once proving this holder estimate, we will be, so let's assume this step. So suppose we completed a holder estimate. Then uh, we will prove from here to get the uh, gradient estimates just by using step one. So this is a easier argument. So, so now, so if under this, So what we can do is, uh, because this holder estimate, so holder estimate, is still giving us Hanak. So this is going to be less than constant, take holder and x minus y to the alpha for x, y, is in B, B1, for example. So this, this is still Hanak. This is still less than C. So we, we have Hanak. So, so this is log. 
u of x minus u of y. So, so this is Hana. ux and uy, they are comparable. So we can reverse you reverse the row of so this is Hana. So so holder estimates already give Hana. So then for the gradient estimates, uh, we can look at u of x over u of zero. Let's look at this function. Yeah. So <coughs> So this function, so because u of zero, so, so this is greater or equal than u of x. So, so yeah. So, so then let's look at the equation. So if we, so let's assume this, uh, this has minus one, uh, has one homo homogene homogeneity, so this is a, homogeneous of degree one, then if we insert this expression in, because AU has homogeneity, certain homogeneity, so we are going to see this will be F of lambda of AU and divided by U of zero, four over N minus two. Uh, my uh, plus power actually. This will be so. So you you are here, here as a u zero to a positive power. So uh, let's take it homogeneous. It's a f equal to one. Yeah, let's let's look at homogeneous. Yeah, let's look at homogeneous. So so this is equal to one, and this is equal to a constant. And this constant is, has an upper bound now. So even though our earlier estimates, we prove all these results for right-hand side equal to one, you replace it by a constant less than one, it's the same proof. It doesn't depend, when it becomes small, all the estimates uh, remain the same, the same proof. It, so, so therefore, we have an upper bound, it's an upper, it's constant upper bound, so our step one will then give gradient log u hat is bounded by c. So now, because this is, uh, 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 this is upper and lower bounded by a, un by a constant now. So this will be bounded by alpha and b. And uh, this is the same as gradient log u. So, so the gradient estimates uh, is proved by first prove there is an upper and lower bound, and then if only upper bound, we prove a holder estimates. So now the main thing is to prove the holder estimates. Now proof of step two. So, so then, so this is B one. So we look at this. Uh, uh, We look at this uh, semi holder norm. If we have a sequence goes to infinity,
So if we have a sequence of solutions, the semi-holder norm goes to infinity. So this is like log ui minus log u i y. So, so then there is a sequence, it goes to infinity. So, well, of course, it may go to the boundary, this, this maximum points. Uh, <coughs> you can do a selection. So, so let's assume that the maximum of this, uh, well, so, <coughs> so one can not just take the, it's not like if we try to normalize this. So I, I can take a maximum point, I, I can go to the maximum point, I rescale. So, well, this is a holder norm. So, uh, well, first, one sort of have a little, uh, this kind of measure, this holder uh, largeness by a small piece. You take a, an appropriate size, uh, uh, a small piece, largeness, and you, you can assume this largeness somehow go to zero. So the largest that thing. It's like it's, if, if we are not doing holder, we are doing gradient, then we, we will say assume the maximum of gradient occurs at the origin. This corresponds to a selection of this maximum point. So, so, so we, we, we do that. So that step will be the same, like, like normalizing the gradient. But here there's a little difference is, so here I can say, I assume the gradient happens at the origin. I go to the origin, I sit there, I rescale, center there, and I will get an entire solution after the limit. So here there is a, here, uh, uh, there's a kind of hold. So, so what? But one one can do a small piece. One can do a measure, catch this largeness by a small piece, uh, large in holder sense, and you take the maximum like that small piece, and then that 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 sort of centered at zero, uh, go to zero somehow. So then you rescale that. Because it goes to zero, that's a maximum. You rescale that, then that notion of uh, holder largeness will become one, just like normalizing the large gradient to become one by rescale the variable. So that will be uh, go to one. So so then, so after the rescaling become that, then it will end up with a solution u, and that solution will be entire. And that solution will end up with, because we normalized, so uh, then one would have a log u, somehow hold the, the large, largest, this is the norm at zero, so it's not quite hold, this is equal to one, so, so we have that. And this will go to that in, any C gamma, gamma bigger than alpha log Rm. Because, our, because, because this is the maximum at the center, when you scale on every bore, you have the maximum chain with the value in holder sense. So on any bounded domain, the log of Ui will have both upper and lower bound. So therefore, the gradient estimate enters, step one enters. Step one enters because uh, we have maximum holder size at zero and everywhere, any unit bore going out, the maximum holder control is at most one. So when you go finite distance, it's bounded above and below. So then step one allows gradient estimates on any bounded place, and uh, then the convergence is higher than alpha, so then this will satisfy equation 
lambda of AU will belong to the boundary because, because this is when we normalize this way, our equation will deteriorate to the to the to this equation. So now the uh, the Liouville theorem comes in. So now we know this solution. So we have this solution. So we know that u has to be equal to constant. And however, it violates this uh, uh, this uh, holder sense at the origin is one because it's just like if you renormalize gradient, this would be gradient of that function at zero is equal to one. So it's a contradiction to that. So, so then, uh, so this, uh, this will give uh, this holder uh, by using this degenerate Liouville to prove this. So I still have 10 minutes. Uh, so, so, so maybe I, I have to stop. So I didn't estimate the time properly. <laughs> so let's thanks uh, Yan Yan for for this uh, second talk. <laughs>